Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Joel Sanderson. And first off, I'd like to thank you, uh, the audience, and everyone, all of Jim Erickson's friends and Leaf for putting this event together. And, and I just wanted to take a few moments to be part of this tribute to Jim. I met Jim in 1976, and actually I was familiar with him from television from long before that. I had a really bad, terrible third shift job, and I wound up taking a small black and white television in, and I watched uh, Nightwatch, Erickson's show, for most of the night. A few years after that, I got the chance to go over to his house. Uh, I started attending Wichita State University. One of my friends, Jeff, Jeff Killian, I asked if he would take me over with him when he was gonna go over to visit Jim one day and, and Jeff took me along. And it was fascinating because it was a museum at the time. I would bring up things and Jim knew exactly what everything was. You know, he'd pull out a magazine and go, oh, here's Famous Monsters number one. Oh, here, here's some 3D EC comic books. You know, it was just, it was amazing. He just kept pulling things out. I wound up leaving Wichita for a while and managing a drive-in in Emporia, Kansas. When I returned to Wichita, I needed a job and I got a job at Wichita State University, but I became Erickson's film class tech guy. I was the guy who set up the movies in his, his class, along with Lance Hayes' class too, and I got to meet and know them both much better through that experience. While I was in the tech office at Wichita State University, Wichita State was throwing away all their films. But I didn't know what to do with it because they were all titled. They weren't think, anything that interested me at all. And I realized that I could transform these films and try and make something new, a new art piece out of them. Cutting Up Films went on for years and turned into a stage show called Empty Pockets Budget Film Fest, which my sister brought to the Wichita Center for the Arts in 1996. And Jim attended pretty near every single performance of the show. It ran for... I think around six to eight years. Towards the end, he wrote an Empty Pockets Manifesto, which I, I actually had him read. And then he came out on stage, I think it might have been his last appearance at Leonard Kratzlow in 2005. And after Empty Pockets finished its run, I wanted to keep things going. So I had always wanted to do a public access TV show. I loved the host and Rodney, um, Tom Leahy's show. I turned it into my own horror host show. Uh, which I called The Basement Sublet of Horror. Around 2015, after The Basement Sublet of Horror had been on it for quite a while, and had actually gone national, Ben Irish brought Jim Erickson up, and we had Jim Erickson host a couple episodes of Basement Sublet of Horror as Old Flick, which I think it might, might also be the last appearance of Old Flick. I'm not really sure. Jim Erickson was a really special person, a very unique person. It's a loss for Kansas, it's a loss for Wichita. It's a loss for media that Erickson is no longer with us. A really great mentor to me, a wonderful influence on my life. Uh, he was very generous. He was very supportive of me and my projects, not only my project, but many other people's projects. Uh, he was open to collaborating, which was fantastic. And he also threw one of the best parties I've ever been to. So thank you, Jim, for all the years I've known you. Thank you, Jim, for everything you've done for me, all your support. And I'm, I'm really going to miss you. Uh, you're a really special person. Uh, I can't describe the emptiness that leaves me with. Presented to you by all that remains of Wichita's not quite legendary old flick. Old flick. Old flick. Well, in the first place, remember, my memory was a symptom 
as far back as the 60s and hasn't improved since then, so I don't have much of a memory of my early life. Actually, almost no memory of childhood. I did come out of a very fundamentalist, very Southern Baptistish kind of Swedish Lutheran home, a home which was biblical literalist, in which um, my father had one personality for the public, which was very charming, and one at home, which is such that whatever good times were going on in our house usually ended when Dad got home. He wasn't a tyrant. He wasn't a brute. He did the best he could. He kept us well fed all the way through the, the uh, Depression. I have to give him credit for that. It left me, above all, with a genuine fear of the world, which was a terrible social handicap and may have been one of the reasons that I retreated into the only thing I could do well, which was schoolwork. Uh, and I got into intellectual activities with a great interest in reading, you know, and all that sort of thing. Um, Partly as a result of that, I wound up as sort of a joker. It was a defense and uh, sort of an intellectual. It was a retreat. I've always been an observer of life, never really an indulger. I've never been really deeply involved in much of anything except maybe the community theater. I joined the Marine Reserve because they met one evening a week. The Navy Reserve, where some of my other friends joined, met one weekend a month. It added up to two more hours a month of uh, meetings, so I went to the Marines. Uh, after all, at the time I went in, everybody knew the war would be over before we could get anywhere near Korea. Even when we got on board ship in San Francisco, uh, we were told uh, that we would probably not get any farther than Hawaii. The ship would turn around and go back. When we landed in Korea, the captain told us, pitch a tent, sit down, we're waiting. The war ended last night, and uh, we are waiting for the sh ships to come and get us. We will go back and take part in the victory parade. Now, that night, the Chinese came over the border, and everything went to pieces. But I was in a lucky squad, 20 people in our mortar squad. Mortars, you know, you're on the other side of the hill. You lob the shell over the top of the hill. Nobody can shoot back at you. The enemy there had very little in the way of mortars, and what they did have wasn't much good. Uh, they didn't throw any fragmentation. I don't know what they were supposed to be good for. Uh, our sergeant told us if one of those shells had landed on our helmet, we would get a hell of a headache, but that would be all. Uh, in our 20 men in my unit, we lost three men to enemy action in a year in a combat zone, most of which was in retired area, but all of Korea and Japan was considered a combat zone. We were in Korea. Uh, we joined the 1st Marines as they were going up into the mountains at the Yalu River where they got all shot to pieces. We were the Southern Guard, my outfit. We didn't get shot. There was nobody down there to shoot at us. When they pulled out of the north, they pulled out south. We were made the Northern Guard so that we could, you know, defend the guys. Well, the Chinese, not being fools, had circled around to the south and they hit the same guys that had been hit going up north, got hit again going down south, and once again we just marched through it. I didn't even know we were in serious trouble until we got back to a reserve camp and the sergeant told us no one will be fed supper tonight unless he gives me a letter to someone back in the United States. Obviously telling them we are alive, we have survived. I got something out of it, I suppose. My own mother wrote me after reserve camp, not boot camp, reserve camp, that she was proud that I had, she didn't think I'd been tough enough to get through camp. I suppose I got out of it a certain sense that I had accomplished something which my friends had made no secret of the fact that they didn't think I could get through. I didn't get through much, but they thought I could get through even less. The closest I ever came to writing something serious was when I was thinking of writing a play called The Fall from Manhood about the utter irrelevance of military service when you get back to civilian life. It meant nothing. Uh, the kind of problems I had 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 nothing to do with whether you can survive being shot at and whether you can survive cold weather. For a person who was teaching film, teach something that after all was not exactly in my field. It was supposed to be in my field when I was hired to come here. The under arrangement was that the chairman of the department at that time, Walter Merrill and I, 
would be building up a film study program at WSU, but Merrill never was able to get the financing for it, so we never got beyond two or three courses. Uh, the only one I ever really wanted to teach was the one I did teach, the opening narrative in literature and film, comparing the features and advantages and so on of fiction to and other forms, drama, poetry sometimes even. T.S. Eliot versus La Dolce Vita, for instance, the uh, love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, very similar structurally and thematically to La Dolce Vita. Most of my film teaching all along, the inadequacy of motion picture for presenting really complex human situations or other situations, at least the narrative movie that most people go to. But it is important, I think, for students to in terms of composition, to not only learn how to express themselves, but learn a certain wariness about other people are trying to influence them by, you know, way they express. And in literature, to be exposed to other ways of looking at the world, not only than their own, but than any they're likely to run into in their immediate community. And one of the ways you can learn a certain amount about these things, I think, without having to go through the miseries yourself is through exposure through the various arts. The one I happen to deal with is literature, drama, and film. Uh, I still think I did a pretty fair job. The other day I ran across one of my old syllabi, the last semester I was teaching, nature drama course, and I read through that syllabi and I thought, syllabus, excuse me, my Latin is weak, and I thought, by God, I would have liked to have taken a teacher who did that. All I asked of the university when I came here, really, was that I would get cost of living increases in pay, which nobody got, and they would leave me alone, and they left me alone. Well, 52 a year since 1974. I don't know what that adds up to, an awful lot more than we're probably worth watching. Uh, published primarily in simply the East Wichita newspaper, there may have been some in some other independent newspaper, never certainly the Eagle. Uh, and um, broadcast, well, mostly on KMUW since 1974. The Hobbit is visually awesome and full of action, but that's about all you can say for it. Jim Erickson, over and out. Or there were also reviews for quite some time well, for about three and a half years, on Channel 13 with Vivian Mincho Ford for the university television station. Uh, I recall sometime way back there doing reviews with Nancy Avery, who was then with the Eagle, at Channel 10, but I'm not at all sure that that's accurate. It may have been Channel 8. Um, I don't know how many it adds up to, an, an ungodly number. I am never disturbed particularly when people say they disagree with me. I disagree with other reviewers. I have had a few occasions on seeing a movie again that I've disagreed with myself. A review, not the work of a critic, is a much more serious matter. The mere reviewer is giving you an impression of the movie from a single showing and is under certain circumstances, which he can pretend to ignore. He can try to ignore, but he will not succeed. It becomes a technical exercise kind of thing. You become too critical. You can't relax and get that naive satisfaction unless you see something that's a veritable masterpiece, like The Return of the King, for instance. But it's very rare that you can get that kind of total immersion in the film. And sometimes I wish I would have preserved that just for fun. I made a hobby into a profession. That's not always a very good idea. Don't regret it, really. And it helped. It helped keep me at the university. It's one of the things I did instead of publication, for instance. But there's a certain cost to it, too. Oh, the Wichita Film Society. I was involved in that, of course, largely because of uh, related to the efforts to establish a film studies project at the university. As I understand it, the Wichita Film Society on campus doesn't exist at all anymore. And uh, the last year I was in it and involved in it, which was quite some time ago, we were down to audiences of extreme smallness. But an indication of what it was like in its glory days, this is a schedule.
for the fall semester of 1980. The Wichita Film Society was showing the Decameron, Fata Morgana, Shoot the Piano Player, Akatone, The Maltese Falcon, La Million, The Bicycle Thief, La Boucher, The Candidate, Pride and Prejudice, The Wind, The Letter That Never Was Sent, and The Last Laugh. Flick was showing Breaking Away, Heaven Can Wait, Kentucky Fried Movie, Ten, The Jungle Book, The Rose, Rock and Roll High School, The Champ, Young Frankenstein, The Graduate, Freaks and Wizard, and The Producers. All in the fall. I don't know the last time I have, on my radio review thing, had to announce a motion picture that was showing on campus. When I came here, I also had a deal with the chairman that as part of our promotion for drama and film, I would work with the community theater. And I discovered that when I was on stage, I had to have my mind on something other than my own problems. It did make me more bookish, and it's probably the reason I went into academic life, mm -hmm. because uh, the only thing I could do that gave me any satisfaction that my parents approved of was schoolwork. Uh, so I wasn't in town here a month before the chairman came over. I was working registration. He said, Mary Jane Teal is having tryouts for Comedia. I will take over your registration duty. You hop down to Second and Fountain there and try out and see if you can get into Comedia. And I went down there, and I must say that uh, she considered me quite a fine for Comedia, especially playing Simpleton. And then finally, I got a serious role in The Wall, and that opened up other things. And then I got tired of Comedia Theater and finally quit. <laughs> Theater gave me a whole social life. And um, you meet uh, quite a variety of people through the community theater. And when there aren't rehearsals, there are parties and this kind of that, then people outside theater don't know that. You're in the theater, you're in the world. You're not in the theater, you're not in their world. Hey, Sam. Hey. Twenty to two. He'll be back in jail before Christmas. Have to give me better odds on that. Evening, Miss Hart. Kind of hot tonight. Yeah, especially a lot of hot air right around the two of you. Uh, it opened up a busy and active and very useful. You make a lot of useful contacts, but not a very complete kind of world. I think that's one of the reasons I got sort of weary of the uh, theater. Parties, actually, I gave back in Minneapolis when I was a kid, whenever my folks left out of town, which was very rare. And I had parties that were well known even back then. Yeah, I won't go into details on those. But when I went to University of Texas, the entire indoctrination, greetings, whatever program was that they had for new faculty, I was the only one added to the English department that year, which may be one of the reasons for it, but they must have had teaching assistants and so on that were coming in, uh, was that uh, I was given a key to the office and a library card. That was it. And I thought, well, no institution at which I work is ever going to treat the incoming people, most of whom come from out of state, they don't know anybody, nobody is ever going to get treated that way in my department again. So the next spring I had a party. By the next fall, the university, the department had made it quite clear they wanted no official connection with my parties, and within a year they were having parties of their own, which were of a much more sedate nature than mine. I always feel pressure to put on a show for anybody who's around. I mean, that's, that's no problem. I was sending out, because I could do it through campus mail, as much as three or four hundred invitations to these parties, and I would get maybe about a hundred people coming to them. It was hard to tell. Because people would be in the house, they'd be across the street in the park, they'd be out in the yard, they'd be all over the place. At Halloween parties, this is where we set up our little tableau. 
Uh, that is the remains of last Halloween's Western Saloon. Before that, the year before we had an auto accident in here. The year before that, I believe, was a feast where you had various monsters and so on. And they sort of caught on. And um, during the 60s and 70s, there were a fair number of people giving these open invitation parties. My theory has always been that for my parties anyway, 25% of the guests should not be personally known by me. That kept fresh blood coming. It kept things interesting, you know, and uh, kept new topics, at least new points of view coming up, all that sort of thing. Uh, I've always gone in big parties. I don't know how to give a small party. Small party is risky. You invite eight people and somebody there is angry at somebody else and the whole party can be shot to hell. You've got a hundred people there and who cares? You can dodge people. I have people come to my party that I would prefer to keep away from. Well, they're big parties. I can keep away from them. Leave them in the next room. Channel 10, which had the way of recording the irrelevant and the blasphemous and picking things out of context, out of context. I was guaranteed that the camera crew would show up early when everybody was sober, and they did not do so. Now, I consider this, uh, do I, is there a lawyer in the audience who will call action and defend him? He needs it. Oh, he needs it. There's no way any of this footage can be used for any purpose except to party. I may have to quit giving parties, but I hate to do it because I'm the last one that gives these. That way of life is gone now. This uh, everybody's welcome, we trust everybody, we love everybody, we're all equal. Spirit of the 60s and 70s. It was never quite that, but you know what I'm talking about. It is gone. <laughs> now, this is what life is like if you become very famous. Jim O'Donnell, take warning. Are you already photographing this? But anyway, the, the party got started that way. At, at our peak, we had four of them. Beginning of the year, end of the year, New Year's Eve, Halloween. We're down now to one per year. Frankly, I would rather like to have the spring and fall ones, but I won't. I can't risk it anymore. They were too big, too anonymous. <laughs> you may not recognize me. Fame is a fleeting thing. But back in, in the vicinity of 1977 in Wichita, Kansas, I played a man named Old Flick and introduced a lot of movies some of them almost as good as the one we're showing tonight. Old Flick was my name then. Well, I guess it's still my name insofar as I have any. It's many years later. Look what happens. Who invented Kratzlow? I don't know. Uh, the name, somebody told me, had been used by somebody like Shelley Berman or some such person. At the time, we didn't know. We didn't know where the name came from. It just sounded like a sort of a second-rate person with a big ego. It was, by, by the way, my biggest success. I was, I was, several times in my life, I was supposed to get rich. The big chance was um, Leonard Kratzlow. Uh, at our peak, I was told we were showing, playing in seven cities. I got mail from both Minneapolis, Minnesota, and Austin, Texas. Friends of mine who had seen me selling what everybody identified as daisy clover potato chips and this potato chip and that potato chip. We shot them out at Channel 10. He was very closely related to my other later character, Old Flick. Both of them were very closely related. Uh, it's significant that Leonard uh, Kratzlow, the potato chip man, for instance, only had this one thing that made his life worthwhile was potato chips. He had one friend named Calvin who was mentioned. Otherwise, there was no social life, no, no profession, no achievement of any kind attributed to Leonard Kratzlow. But his life was made worthwhile because he was the world's greatest connoisseur of potato chips, and he had found the greatest potato chip in all the world, the Stay Crisp potato chip. They knew who Leonard Kratzlow was, but they did not know the name of the chip, which I think may have been one of the reasons that, well, nobody knows what happened to steak with potato chips, but they disappeared from the market, and there went Leonard Kratzlow with them. And that was the end of that chance for me to make fame and fortune. So here I still am in Wichita, which is probably just, well, I don't know where I'd be any better off. I don't know where I would have lived a better life anyway. <laughs> Leonard Kratzlow. His first public appearance in what, 20 years? 
Erickson says you're just a bunch of low-brow hooligans and he won't have anything more to do with you. He went home. The grand prize, actually kind of cool, is a antique Davy Crockett poster. It says, turn card. Turn card. Yes. I suppose you all noticed it was a Daniel Boone poster. Uh, let's see, what was it after Stay Crisp? Um, well, the yard store things, of course, run only during the athletic season, I understand. What kind of stuff do you find at the yard store? Next year's coat at last year's prices. Saws and shovels, drills and vices, precision tools, tarps and hose, luggage, vinyl, surplus clothes. Actually, the yard has so much stuff you could spend days here. Acres and acres of hardware and steel. What you want's in here somewhere and they'll give you a deal. Now, some of it's surplus or been used before. So if you need something strange and you've looked long and hard, don't give up yet. Just come to the yard. Uh, I know one of the deans, I was told by his secretary, climbed the wall and clung to the ceiling by his fingernails every time one of my commercials came on. How this happened in his office so she saw it, I don't know. Uh, he never spoke to me about it, never once. I was once told, well, I, I met President Armstrong one time. President Armstrong and I were not on the same side of the fence on most things, so we didn't meet often. But I mentioned to him the fact that I'd always appreciate the fact they'd left me alone with my television commercials and stuff like that, which didn't do much, actually. Uh, a lot of people felt for the image of the university or me. And he turned to me with a rather surprised look, and he said, "What?" What did you expect me to do? He said, that's your private life. That's none of my business. I don't get called on television commercials anymore, and I don't quite understand why that was. Um, old Flick, it was significant that he was sitting in a worn-out, battered old chair wearing an extremely unfashionable sweater. I'm not exactly a, um, well, as you can see, I'm something of a fashion leader, but I wasn't back then. Uh, I'm not a man of sartorial elegance, but even I objected to that sweater. It was so incredibly drab. And outside the window, there was a light that flashed red off, red off, that you know said either dance hall or liquor store or something like that. Second floor, shabby little apartment, a man of no achievement whatsoever. Old Flick here to remind you, not all mobile home dealers are created equal. Blocks, tie-downs, and steps absolutely free. They're the only dealer offering strictly wood sided homes for strength and durability. For the best in mobile homes, my friend, your searching has come to an end. We did have quite a bit of discussion, a lot of talk about what Old Flick was supposed to be called. I remember he had names like Mr. All Night Long was one of them, for instance, and I can't remember what the rest of them were. Um, Old Flick had only one thing going for him, that he was, uh, that he did know something about movies. Welcome! I am Old Flick, of course, and I am welcoming you to Kansas' first time ever three-dimensional motion picture on television. <laughs> and since I am here to represent the cultural and educational aspect of this venture, as well as to try to catch the creature from the Black Lagoon, I have assigned a couple of my friends to handle the more plebeian matter of showing you how to watch this movie. Now have your glasses ready and watch these people closely, because this is not like other movies on television, because this one is in 3D. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh yeah, there's the old flick sign. The one that, uh, here, let's get some of the dust off that. Turn it sideways and it read very unfortunately for the first week or so we were on. We didn't realize what it read until they broadcast it and it was too late to do anything about it. But, uh, well, we, we survived it. It was on late at night, so we didn't get any complaints that I know of. And when I was doing old flick, I learned enough about what it is to be a celebrity to realize it is no fun to be a celebrity. You can't go to a garage sale. You can't go to movies. Well, old Flick can't find the creature from the Black Lagoon, but you can find the revenge of the creature in 3D right here in your home this Saturday at 6. If you get your 3D glasses at your local quick shop and tune into Cake TV 10, where you are now, Saturday at Six. <laughs> I'll be hosting if I don't catch cold. So get your 3D glasses at the Quick Shop and be with us Saturday at uh, six. <laughs> uh, old Flick, of course, went off because mm. um, cable came in and then Martin sold the station. Now earlier I had done a somewhat similar series for um, Channel 10 
of 14 Sherlock Holmes movies as a character named by John Froome, Dr. Gray Matter. Dr. Gray Matter was a very different matter. Uh, I did not realize at the time that I photographed for some reason looking like Nigel Bruce, or did back then. I don't think anybody realized that till we started broadcasting. Dr. Gray Matter was a person of some sophistication. He wore a, I thought, rather elegant purple bathrobe. It was cheap, but it looked elegant. I think, I think it was cheap anyway. If I recall correctly, it was one that was given to me um, by my folks. They were not in a position to buy expensive clothes, but it looked good. And he uh, lived in a place that certainly did not indicate lower economic level, although it didn't necessarily indicate very high level either. But he, he showed no signs of, of poverty or deprivation. He was a man of some culture. He even spoke with my version of a British accent, which it was supposed to, as a matter of fact, be based somewhat on Nigel Bruce, sort of a, Mr. Holmes, uh, Mr. Holmes uh, was, was, uh, was a good friend of mine, very intelligent, you know, that kind of a thing. Uh, but uh, that was not the uh, vein that seemed to come natural to me. That's not what people generally put me in. I generally played people who were not spectacularly successful in life. But celebrities have no privacy. They stay home all the time. They can't go anywhere, and they turn into Michael Jackson's and the later Elvis Presley's and so on. I got just a little tiny touch of that, enough to realize that I would prefer not to be recognizable. Unfortunately, people who don't know my face, and they don't anymore now I'm off television, know my voice. I get identified by voice all over the place. We had high hopes for King Kung Fu. Even Mary Jane Teal, who saw just the still, said the production values looked really good. And I, of course, was only involved in a couple of scenes. I didn't have any dealings with major cast members except for Ballet himself. And he was, of course, in his gorilla costume. I shall cease pronouncement of philosophical crap. <laughs> Look, kid, you want to go, I want to get ready. I think I can dump you on the United States. We were working indoors, fortunately, where there was air conditioning. But between shots, he would lie down and take off the gloves of his grill costume, and the sweat would run out, not drip, but run in a steady stream out of the end of those sleeves. He was not in a state to be particularly sociable. How he survived the outdoor shooting in July, having the foggiest idea, uh, I was told that his doctor had told him, don't do this, don't do this, you'll kill yourself. But he survived somehow. But um, I didn't have much dealings with him. And the rest of the cast wasn't there. There was one short scene I was involved in out at the zoo. But it was very short. I had very nothing to do. The big thing about that is I did get to see the heroine in her bikini, and she looked very good. But I didn't really. Well, I must have met her, because I met her some years later, and she recognized me. But that may have been the way people always recognized me, it seemed like. I never had the highest hopes for the thing, really, as far as my profession is concerned. I had, by that time, long ago abandoned any notion that I was going to become some kind of a, you know, theatrical or film or television phenomenon. Now, Jim, you, you play the, the karate master who uh, was the master of, of the gorilla from the start. You are in this. Are you going to review this movie? I was just kind of curious about that. Are you going to give this movie a review when you see it? I haven't decided. If I did, <laughs> I think I would concentrate on the obvious star character. I could write a review of his role already without being burdened with having seen it. And if I didn't do that, people would still assume I had done it. So I don't know whether I'm going to bother to review it or not. <laughs> The Burl Ives look is out, the Tom Selleck look is in, so this film isn't going to do it for me. <laughs> and um, I did it mostly just for fun and had a pretty good time doing it. When I went to the theater with that thing, we at the uh, premiere showing. About 250 people attended the world premiere showing tonight. It's an excellent movie. I'd recommend it to anyone. And the Wichita portions of the movie made it extra special. Well, I know some of the people in it. I heard a lot of people laugh. All through the movie, heard a lot of people laugh. And uh, that pleases me very much. Uh, every time I have seen it since then, I've had the misfortune of seeing it three or four times. It seems to me my performance is worse. <laughs> paid. I was lucky I got paid, which is more than some people have put many times more effort into it than I did. Somebody told me one time I was more involved in good causes than anybody else he knew. I'd like to know what his social circle is because it must be full of people who are involved in virtually nothing. Uh, I do wear buttons. 
I used to actually distribute buttons till I found that nobody ever wore them. I'd make them up, you know, at my own cost for the American Civil Liberties Union and pro-choice buttons and pass them out to people till I discovered that I had never seen one worn. People would be glad to have them. They would even come and ask for one, can I have a button? But they never wore the thing, even if they agreed they were going to. So I quit doing that, but I always wear them. But that's about all I do. I am the president of the Friends of the Library, Friends of the yeah, friend of the Wichita Public Library. I've in the past been a little more active with the Civil Liberties Union. Uh, I uh, don't have the energy anymore. Maybe I was spoiled by the high hopes of the 60s, although I never shared those high hopes very much. I never thought we were going to accomplish great and wonderful things. We do not fight uh, the kind of environmental pollution, which I think we're beginning to pay some prices for right now, uh, with the storm seasons, which I understand the storms are more ferocious because the ocean water is warmer and the ocean water is warmer because of things which we may very well be responsible for. Uh, we keep quibbling about good science and so on when the things that we are supposed to do for the environment are things we should very well do for economic and political reasons anyway. Whether, you know, uh, whether uh, carbon monoxide is causing the temperature to go up or not, there are certain things that ought to be done because the temperature is going up. If the temperature is not going up, we are still better off if we could find an alternate form of energy to oil. So on and so on. I find the whole scene extremely discouraging. And um, so I'm not very political active anymore. This is a little world that has been constructed in case the big world for some reason becomes inaccessible or unacceptable. I remember for many, many years ago thinking that's what my house would be. It would be a little world all to itself. To have its movies, its radio programs, its books, everything I needed actually. Uh, but that's sort of foolish. Everything you need can't possibly be in the house anyway. I don't know, I suppose if I actually had this appraised, people have actually suggested I should have all this stuff appraised. It's ridiculous. I don't know how you go about doing it even. I suppose there's a certain amount of value to it, but that's worth it too. I think it's worth more to me to preserve as a collection than it is for the money it would get me. I don't know what I'd do with the cash. This is also full of LP records now. So, this of course will eventually move. That has to go. Citizen Kane, Seven Samurai, La Dolce Vita, in that order, and then there's a big drop, and then there's a whole cluster of them. Um, the pawnbroker would rate very, very high. Chicago rates very high. The entire Lord of the Rings series. And you get beyond that, and you're, you're simply into a, a huge pile of them. You notice almost none of those are comedies. I tend toward the rather grim, unhappy ending kind of a thing. Always have. I would say certainly Plan 9 from Outer Space would be one of them. Um, I've never thought much about movies in terms of guilty pleasure, as a matter of fact. Happy Go Lovely largely because of Vera Allen. Um, Where the Boys Are with Connie Francis. My current one is Stardom, starring Gen Jessica Pere, which I'm sure you've never heard of. Uh, has Dan Aykroyd in it and Frank Langella, made in Canada, which I absolutely love. I've shown it to about six of my friends. None of them are impressed by it except me. There's one called If Ever I See You Again, which is rated bomb in the rating book starring Shelley Hack, that I've always rather thought really highly of. But the fact is, I don't see movies over and over again. Plus, see, I haven't got such a bad life. Uh, I don't make a lot of money, but I'm a single man. I don't need a lot of money. I don't have expensive habits. I don't like to travel. Find something you're satisfied in doing that you feel is sufficiently useful to satisfy you. If you are contented where you are and somebody else is not contented where he is, you have a right to figure, I made it. He didn't. Even if he's the president of International Oil and you are a, a ditch digger. If you're happy, you've made it.
And I wish, I wish people other than Gandhi and Thoreau would say that. <laughs> called him King Kung Fu. I was not uh, deeply involved, shall we say, in King Kung Fu. I only had a couple of scenes. I played the karate master with, take one look, look at me, you can see I didn't do any karate. Philosophy I could manage because I'm always gas bagging around about something which I don't know, which I think a lot of philosophers do. I was very active with the community theater, done a lot of people, a lot of roles. I was considered pretty good at character comedy. The character was not particularly Chinese, after all. He was a character of, of Chinese on both the karate side and the philosophy side. The dialogue was written uh, like a comic book, Chinaman, and uh, I think they wanted to deal with people they had dealt with before from the community theater. There wasn't, as far as I know, there was never a person of Asian ancestry involved with the community theater. Jumper. It is once again the hour of our daily ritual. If it is today that you possess the swiftness and agility to grasp the object from my hand before I remove it, the moment will have come for you to pass through our gates and meet the vast world beyond. Will you be quick, little jungle jumper? Will destiny decree this as the instant of your triumph? Catch me if you can! Nya, 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 nya. <laughs> <laughs> Wise is the man who knows when to release house pet of whom he cannot control or teach anything more, too. Your time has come, Jungle Jumper. I will make of you a gift, for wise also is the man who sends his problems to so-called friends who will accept unusual offerings without knowledge of the background of said offering. <laughs> I shall cease pronouncement of philosophical crap. Look, kid, you want to go, I want to get ready. I think I can dump you on the United States. But let me give it to you straight. They won't buy the con unless you sound more important. What I mean is, that cutesy name, Jungle Jumper, just don't cut it image-wise. We got to call you something with more of a Zubiz sound, dig. Uh, like, um, like Prince Kong or Mighty Joe Youthful. You know, something that'll make people wonder what you are. I don't even know where to start with Jim, so I'm going to wing it here. It may not be entirely accurate, but it's how I remember it. <laughs> so I can say, you can check with the other people and see if it, any of it jives. I met Jim 30-some years ago through Bob and Vivian. 
Vivian Minshall Ford uh, had done reviews with him, and Bob was a philosophy professor. They were nice people and like him, and we hit it off. And um, they had an Oscar party every year. Um, what I remember about that is Jim, I don't think he ever won. <laughs> he didn't even come close, mostly. Um, he voted what he believed, and that's the way it was, and he would lose because of that. Um, he was always very gracious about it, grumbled a little bit, but it was fun. He came back every year, and this went on for, I guess, 30 years, I'm guessing. Everybody's going to talk about the kind of parties he had. I will give you one story. Uh, brought a friend of mine, her name was Donna. She had never been to Jim's house, and it was Halloween. And this was umpty ump years ago, probably 15, 18 years ago, I don't know. And she's going, to, ooh, ah, <laughs> and everything is just amazing to her. Well, <laughs> she walks up and says, Mr. Erickson, Mr. Erickson, I really love what you've done with your house for this this party. It was it's just amazing. He gives it. Us. <laughs> yeah, it was a priceless look. She was being sincere. She really thought he had decorated the place, and uh, it was home. Fritz and I were making a documentary on him when we went to Jim's <laughs> to shoot his uh, footage. Um, he either was going went out to the car, or was coming back to the car. I don't know what. But Fritz took a wrong turn and got lost in this house. I had to find him, get him out. But um, that's the kind of house it was. It was fun. But he was always the light of the party. He could keep a room going, entertained. Uh, people loved him. He was a fun man. Uh, all I can say about him, he was one of a kind, and I will miss him. <laughs> he just is a person that deserves a memorial. and. Here it is, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. I had never actually, as far as I, I, I know, I had never taken a, an actual film course, but they hired me to teach this course anyway, because in those days, there were so few people that had taken film courses, which are available only in UCLA and half a dozen other places, that it was impractical to require them. Uh, to have uh, taken a film course. That was in 1974, I believe, I started teaching that course. It still exists, but three other people have taught it by now, and it is not recognizable as the same course that I taught. I knew Jim, I think as far back as maybe 35 years ago. I'm sure I went to uh, one of his parties at, at the house on Hillside, where he lived, but uh, I went to an awful lot of the other parties, the ones at the on Fairmount Park, and of course his house was a, a, just a treasure trove of movie memorabilia, even on the ceiling, and and uh, cutouts of Elvis and all sorts of things, and you saw something new every time, and he got them all from garage sales. Now, he also got his shirts from garage sales with those lurid sort of nylon shirts. And, uh, and when I reviewed movies with him at the beginning of the 80s, uh, we were rather like Siskel and Ebert. We, uh, um, you know, we're sort of like thumbs up, thumbs down, pretty good, uh, close. I can't remember how we did it actually now, but because of the, the feeble equipment in the studio, they didn't have the best equipment and the lighting people weren't the very best. Uh, I used to have to go and look at the shirt he was going to wear and then find something in my wardrobe that would kind of be roughly the same tone. Otherwise, everything would be uh, screwed up just just because of the sort of lack of balance in, uh, va uh, you know, color values. And uh, we always agreed to differ, but we did not agree to differ when we were being filmed on the screening room he would say something like well now Vivian who spent more time on the film's plot than the film did or he'd say something like uh, because what you did was you talked for uh, you had about um, five minutes to give your little presentation on the film that you've seen if you were first and then when uh, when you stopped the next person 
had his chance to rebut or whatever. Well, he always rebutted. And very often it began with something like, well, I suppose you enjoyed it. <laughs> and sometimes I did. He also had a toothpick, which he used to wave at me if he disapproved, or he just used to wave. It was part of his uh, shtick. That's what he did. And people used to call my mother and ask them if somebody could call Jim and ask him not to have a toothpick because it looked so bad. <laughs> uh, Jim's idea of a great film was Citizen Kane, and I'm not arguing with that, but I've kind of always hated it ever since he and I had to do a, uh, a presentation of Citizen Kane at a solar festival organized by, by uh, John Garvey to, uh, for, for some houses that he was selling somewhere um, in East, you know, along Kellogg somewhere. And uh, it was the worst weather anybody had ever seen and nobody could stand to, they, they, they were so busy trying to keep warm uh, in various places or getting hot cups of tea in, in, uh, or coffee or alcohol in various places that nobody really wanted to come and listen to either of us talking about Citizen Kane and you know it was one of those moments when I thought I was praying not for rain but a miracle like you know a sort of uh, something to come out of the sky and save me save me from having to make a real idiot of myself <laughs> But we devoted entire five weeks of a uh, three hours a week course to a shot analysis of Citizen Kane, stopping after virtually every shot and analyzing the position of people on the screen and the costuming and the lighting and everything we could think of that seemed relevant. Since then, I found out that most of this stuff or at least an awful lot of the stuff that was very important we didn't realize was relevant because we didn't know what was going on. Uh, the man who I was co-teaching it with for a while said that there is not probably a shot in Citizen Kane that does not involve special effects. I was a colleague of Jim's in the English department for the entire time that uh, I was there until Jim retired in 1998. We were also members of the faculty senate together where I have my favorite memory of Jim. It was 1995. We had gone through a number of years without a raise when one of the administrative vice presidents for finance came in and said, next academic year you're going to get a 2.5% across the board raise. The Senate was delighted, but he then stopped us and said, however, because of the finances, the raise will only begin in the spring semester. Jim's hand went up immediately, and when called upon, he removed the toothpick he was frequently chewing on, and said, if I'm going to get a mythical raise in the fall semester, could you make mine 1,000%? I would like to tell my friends I do so much good work for this university that they raised my salary 1,000%. The faculty burst into laughter until the faculty Senate President banged his gavel and said, enough, enough, we don't need sarcasm here. But at the end of the meeting, everybody came up to Jim, patted him on the shoulder and said, that was a good one, Jim. That's the Jim Erickson I remember. I was a student of Jim's and also a friend. When I came back to Wichita, Jim always held court on Monday nights at Harry's Bar and Grill. And it, he had been doing uh, movies, uh, reviews. And so he'd come in and he'd ask what the plot was on this movie or that one because he didn't get it. And uh, turned out that he had actually fallen asleep during some of them, but that was Jim. Uh, Jim uh, was a lifelong confirmed bachelor and needed some help around his house. So I helped him around his house a bit and got to really get to know him. And he came, became like a second father to me. And so Chris and I used to take him to lunch. And one time we went to Dylan's and the steak dinner came with the steak and two sides. Jim only wanted the steak and one side. He wanted corn. 
And the uh, worker just didn't understand what he was asking about. And I said, don't worry about it. Just give him the steak and give him the corn. So we got that settled. He thoroughly enjoyed his meal and he didn't understand why he didn't know that they did had those kind of lunches. They were fantastic. <laughs> but that was Jim. I still judge by movies by the standards of 1940s, 50s, and, and early 60s. When you were expected to have a coherent plot with a beginning, a middle, and an end, and one story, and a hero, and uh, a consistent theme all the way through, and that every scene contributed to the development of the characterization, the story, and the theme. I still expect that in movies. They don't even attempt that anymore in movies. Well, Jim's house was something to see. It was packed the way a hoarder's house would be packed, except it was all items that pertain to his profession. He's an English professor, so he has books galore. Bookcases packed, double stacked, triple stacked. And he was teaching a films program, so he also had videos, and these were all on VHS. Four movies to a video, numbered into the thousands of individual cassettes, packed shelf after shelf after shelf, and then he had various mementos, film posters and figurines and refrigerator magnets, completely packed the house. There's almost no way to sit. And when he had a Halloween party, he had it also full of Halloween decorations. So some people had to stand and walk between piles of things just to navigate the house to attend the party. Jim Erickson was noted for giving unusual Halloween parties. This was an annual event for many years where he invited everyone he knew and a lot of people that he didn't know to come to his house to celebrate. Some of these photos show his unique costumes and his unique home decorating ideas where he set up a display in the back room, a different display every year. These photos include some that are from his very last party, which was in 2009. We'll miss you, Jim. I'm here to tell a little story about our favorite uh, professor, Dr. Erickson. I got out of the military in the 1980s, going to WSU, and I took a uh, film class from Dr. Erickson. And in talking with him, and I knew him from before I went to the military, he had done... Uh, commercials for the yard, he was Leonard Kratzlow on TV, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I had the honor of going over to his uh, house. And uh, anyone that's ever been there for the Halloween Christmas parties and everything, know the place was absolutely packed. There were posters on the walls, the ceiling and everything. And that's when I uh, uh, went over to see him. It was an afternoon. And uh, there uh, we came through the typical uh, kitchen entrance. And there were posters on the wall. I remember a uh, an original insert for Animal World, 1960, with, and uh, posters on the ceiling. Well, he gave me the nickel tour of his house. We went through the kitchen, you know, looking at all the stills and the photos. Down the hallway, turn again. To the left was his uh, add-on uh, library where he had thousands of books on shelves. And we continued down the uh, hallway towards the living room. And walked in the living room, and you know, there's uh, you know couches and not not as much stuff on display. And we're walking back towards the kitchen, and uh, I noticed he had a uh, record collection and everything. And he stops for a second, and I said, "You know, I've been looking forever this original movie soundtrack for the movie The Andromeda Strain." And uh, without without moving an inch, he turns at the waist reaches down and pulls up and says, you mean this? <laughs> and I was flabbergasted. Here he has the original pressing for the Andromeda Strain soundtrack. He went on to explain when he reviewed movies and he would go the, uh, for the movie review, you know, that he would later put in the newspaper or on the radio. Uh, a lot of times the uh, theater managers would have promotional material. A lot of times they were record album soundtracks. So uh, that's my little story about Dr. Erickson, that uh, he's a tremendous guy, uh, loved films. Uh, we all loved him. And uh, thank you for your time and my, uh, telling my story. When I started teaching back in the 60s, 
things were moving fast enough that one generation could not communicate well with another generation. By the time I retired in 1997, the graduating class with a BA after four years could not communicate well with the incoming freshmen because in that four years, the internet had developed or the home computer had developed or something like that. And uh, as a result, the motion picture nowadays, I don't know what they're attempting to do. I don't know how to judge, well, comedy. Uh, I, don't, I don't try to review comedies because what I find funny, other people don't find funny, and what they think is hilarious look to me like rather normal living. I mean, uh, the world is full of peculiar people. At least my world has always been full of peculiar people. I think if you get to know any single group, you'll find they are rather peculiar people. The norm doesn't exist. I've known Jim ever since I got here. The 40 years. Kind of hard to just sum up somebody's life in a few words. I got to start with by saying, you know, he's one of the most interesting people I ever met. Um, just, you know, there was never a dull moment with him. He's always up to something, doing something. Um, he, he was um, quite a character. There was always something different, something new. Almost, you know, just a lot of creativity in his day to day, -to -day living. Um, yeah, what do we remember most about him? Is I guess the parties. It used to be Halloween, typically, right? That was the big one. The Halloween where everybody on Earth showed up and got dressed up and went to that cavernous house of his <laughs> and got lost in the bookshelves and <clears throat> you know, the, the uh, stacks of records. Um, just the most amazing parties. And really just everybody who was everybody or anybody who was any, anybody, I'm not kidding that right, was there and me as well. <clears throat> I had a few ordinary people there. To something. It's really a, a, a contribution to my life just to know him. The movies, as a result, rely on strong individual scenes. They make awfully good individual scenes nowadays. Uh, they do extremely well with acting on individual scenes as long as the character doesn't have to develop. Uh, and they do extremely well on action and special effects and so on. But they don't make movies that are a unit, even as long as the old standard movies were about an hour and a half long. Two hour long movie like The Grapes of Wrath was considered an epic. Uh, nowadays, two hours is almost a minimum for a movie that intends to be taken seriously. The ones that are shorter than that are usually shorter because of budget, not because of intention. So I had a chance to mentor in the Fairmount neighborhood, and um, one of the things that we focused on was literacy. Uh, Jim Erickson uh, being the uh, English lit, English lit uh, professor emeritus on campus, uh, fell right into our program. He made sure to stock our libraries, uh, and and when in 2008 the uh, United Church of Christ, which founded Wichita State University, asked uh, members of the community to participate in a conversation about race. I invited Jim uh, to come into the church uh, to listen to what I had to say about race, and he affirmed uh, me. And since then, uh, Jim and I have been, uh, at least I can say, that I began to revere Jim. Um, uh, he is such a genius in my regard. Um, he had a breadth of, of experience in terms of literary work, video, and uh, uh, audio recordings. And so I would like to share with you that uh, Jim shared some of his 
music library with me. I took some of his music to my mom in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, music from Duke Ellington and Count Basie and Sarah Vaughn and Ella Fitzgerald. And before I knew it, my mom was singing and we were dancing together. And I will always treasure Jim for his ability to share and give of his talent, of his treasure, and of his time. So I missed you, Jim. Uh, love you very much. And uh, I'm so appreciative of this project that uh, will keep your memory and your spirit alive. I love you. Take care. And I don't know what the movies are attempting to do now, except that they are giving you a certain amount of of action, a, a lot of uh, not what we would call plot. Well, I, I guess you'd simply have to call it acting. Something is going on all the time, but something is going on on the screen now may have no connection with what was uh, going on on the screen 20 minutes ago. Uh, I've forgotten the name of the title of it. I have no memory at all anymore either. But uh, a movie I saw started off as being quite an effective satire on telemarketing and wound up as sort of an imitation of the island of Dr. Moreau with a man who was changing people into horses. The two are not closely connected, but I don't recall any review that I read that condemned that movie as being disjointed or a collection of fragments of various genres, but that's what the movies are now. So if you're if you were at least a tween in Wichita in the mid eighties, you might remember a thing called Channel Twelve City Line. Um you would dial into a uh, a phone number where you could get information. You could get news or weather or sports or event listings, and they had movie reviews. And Jim did the movie reviews. Uh, these wonderful little, you know, I don't know, three or four minute capsules that he had written and he would read uh, in his distinctive style, not unlike, you know, what he did for years on KMW. And I used to listen to these. I was 10 or 11 at the time, but I was weird. And I was watching Siskel and Ebert every weekend and reading Bob Kurtwright in the paper. The City Line reviews were on demand and I could listen to them whenever I wanted. And I did. I listened to them all the time. I loved his delivery, I think, initially. Just that, you know, that, that sort of staccato delivery and that voice, that distinctive voice that was somehow both hard-boiled and nasal at the same time. But the more I listened, the more I was learning about how to write a movie review from Jim and how to think critically about movies and how to analyze what was on the screen. Um, and I realize now how formative those reviews were for me. You know, I've become a film critic and a, a film historian myself. And I, when I meet with colleagues and we talk about influences and everyone talks about Pauline Kael, which of course was huge, Roger Ebert, a big influence, but I, you know, Jim was as much of an influence as, as any of, of those on me. And I think in a lot of the same ways that Ebert was, because they were similar people. They were both, you know, uh, sort of affable Midwesterners uh, and colorful characters. And you never got a sense when you were reading them or listening to them uh, the way you would get from, you know, a Rex Reed or a John Simon or someone that they were these snooty know-it-alls. You know, it was like they were like your, your, your kooky uncle who was over uh, for family dinner on Sunday and telling you about some crazy movie that you might not even ever see, but it was just fun to listen to them talk about it and to soak up that energy and that, that enthusiasm and uh, that, that spirit of wanting to share it with you and wanting to tell you about it. And I think that was sort of what I encountered more when I got to know Jim personally, first as a filmmaker and then as a film programmer when we started the, the film series at the Orpheum was that he, he just wanted to tell you about things and wanted to, he was never writing from above the audience. He was always writing from within the audience. And 
you know, when we would have show these films or have these events and he would he would talk about them in his column or on the radio, there was always a sense that he wanted to invite everyone along and he wanted there to be a, a real and vibrant and active film community in Wichita. And he wanted to be a part of it. You know, he would come to these screenings that we'd have at the Orpheum for these movies he'd seen a million times. Um, but he just loved that we were doing it. And he loved talking to people about, you know, Night of the Living Dead or, or White Christmas or whatever. Um, and I don't know, I guess it's just that spirit that, that, that meant so much to me, that idea that, uh, that he's curious and he wants you to be curious and he wants you to come along. Uh, he wants to invite you in. It's never an insular thing, film or, or books or music or art or whatever he was talking to you about. He always wanted to share it with you. Uh, and for you, it's for you to glean uh, and soak up some of that enthusiasm. And I think that's something that we all uh, can aspire to as arts writers and as teachers, but also just as, as arts lovers and connoisseurs and consumers. Uh, that spirit of just of of wanting to include everyone and and go along for the ride, and uh, I think that's that's what I will miss the most about Jim. I, I saw um, oh what was it uh, the uh, Easy Rider the other day, even more than when it first came out. That looked like a connection of fragments. The, the one thing it had to do that held it together, more or less, was at the time it included the kind of fragments, the desert colonies and the communes and so on, that were quite commonly commented as being reality at the world. Uh, I find it seems rather irrelevant now because that's not the kind of fragmentation society is is uh, involving now. It is so involved with solved fragmentation, it still should be involved uh, with something relevant to our lives. But it doesn't seem to be. And I've talked to others of my generation, or roughly, there aren't many people of my generation around. I'm 87. Almost all the world is dead of my generation. They're all gone. Uh, they won't let me use the word here, but or I would say they have turned into worm shit long ago. But I, I'm not going to say that because they'll cut it out. You'll notice you didn't hear it, did you? No, you didn't. I'm a relatively new friend of Jim's. Um, I was working on a film with uh, uh, Raymond Rice, and uh, we met Jim at his house. And Jim uh, took us back into his house. And any of you have been in Jim's house, it was quite cluttered. And uh, Jim led us into this back room, which I assume was his office, I'm not quite sure. And I set up a tripod and a camera and got ready to do some voice recording too with a separate audio recorder and noticed I didn't have any batteries. So I had to go back to the car. Well, I walked back the way we came in, I thought, and walked through the labyrinth of his house and got to a point where I didn't know where I was. I was looking for the front door, which should be pretty easy to find, but I didn't find it. So I yelled out, Ray, Ray, come help me. I don't know where I am, I'm lost. So Ray came and helped me find the front door and eventually got the batteries and we did the videotaping for our documentary. While we were working on this documentary, uh, Ray Rice and I, we would often go to Jimmy's Diner on Rock Road for well, sort of a brunch. Once in a while, we noticed that uh, Jim Erickson was there, sitting by himself, sometimes giving the waitresses trouble. And um, so we'd often go sit by him and talk to him a little bit. He'd often be reading, say, a novel, and he'd talk to us about the novel and uh, or a magazine article. And then we'd also talk a lot about politics. He loved to talk about politics and had some very strong opinions about things. Another thing we talked about a lot was his hearing because he couldn't hear us talk very well. And, and he kept saying for, uh, that he needed hearing aids and he needed to go to the VA to get hearing aids. Some of you may not know, but uh, Jim was a veteran. 
he was involved in Korea and he led a group of people that uh, planted mortars to shoot at the enemy. And he told a story, and I won't get this quite right. There's no way of telling it like Jim told anything. Um, but uh, they went up a mountain and were supposed to plant themselves about halfway up the mountain, probably, I think, to shoot up the mountain or whatever towards the enemy. And uh, all of a sudden they, they came under fire, very heavy fire, and they got a order from his superior that they were supposed to either hold that position or move forward towards the enemy. Well, Jim said, hell no, I'm not doing that. So they, they left. And uh, I'm sure Jim got in quite a bit of trouble for disobeying orders. Um, in fact, he said that uh, when he went stateside or went to the next place, that they uh, kept their eye on him to keep him out of trouble. He was a very charismatic uh, individual, and I really enjoyed listening to his stories. And as a result, I don't know what the motion picture is trying to do, and as a result, I don't know whether it's succeeding. Anything should be judged, largely at least, on the basis of what it's attempting, and I no longer know what the motion picture is attempting. I can only analyze, really, the fact that it is failing to do what I'm looking for. And that's not much of a criticism because they had no intention of doing that in the first place. It, it's a, a, a reflection, in a way, of the way we see the world. We used to think it was simple. When I moved back to Wichita uh, in the late 80s, right before I turned 17, um, a lot of people knew I was interested in movies or very passionate about movies. And often people would tell me I had to meet this guy, Jim Erickson, that he was really in many ways the local film guru. Over the years, I had so many different types of people tell me to meet Jim or tell me about his Halloween parties. And it just never happened. But what struck me as fascinating was that it was all kinds of people all ages, all races, all financial levels, poor people, rich people, black people, white people, Chinese people, people, foreign students, you know, everybody. Um, an older woman from my mom's church, a, a wonderful friend of the family, had taken Jim's class and loved it and told me I should get to meet this guy, Jim. And then another time I was working with a young black filmmaker, a guy who was in his early 20s, and he started talking about Jim. And it was clear to me, this guy was pretty special. Anybody who could touch that many people, not just that many people, but that many different types of people, must be a pretty special guy. And then in 2006, I, I finally got to meet Jim. A, a, a local filmmaker was doing a kind of support group for filmmakers and, uh, and film discussion kind of group, and Jim was there. And uh, it was a good time. We all showed clips. Uh, Randy Parker attended, Tim McGill and uh, it was fun. But afterwards, we all went and grabbed coffee or drinks or something at, uh, I think, Barnes & Noble. How cool this memory was is that we had a, a young filmmaker in his 20s. And I think I was in my 30s at the time. And uh, and then we had guys in his 40s, 50s. We had a gen And then Jim was, like, you know, in his 70s. Uh, si at least 60s, but I think 70s. And... We had like five or six generations of film lovers there, all talking and all discussing movies and having a good time. And that just was kind of unique, I thought. And the thing about Jim is he was always willing to engage anybody about film. And no matter how many years since 2006 that I saw him off and on, he never lost his passion. He never lost his enthusiasm. He was never burned out. He didn't like a lot of the new movies. <laughs> you know, he wouldn't, I'd invite him to movies that we'd show, and he, you know, he would tell me, you know, he'd come, uh, but even films, wonderful films like, you know, Blade Runner, he didn't particularly care for. And he was convinced, because his hearing was, he was having hearing problems, and he told me this often, that he was convinced the new filmmakers were mixing their movies so you couldn't understand the dialogue, and he didn't understand that. There is some validity 
to that argument or complaint, but he was saying about every movie. So, um, but Jim always was always ready to talk about movie or art or politics. And, uh, I only hope to be able to emulate that. I hope to be like him in that I never lose my zeal, my love, my passion for the stuff we love. Jim didn't. We love you, Jim. I hope you're watching. I know you may not like this, but I hope you do. Thanks for everything, Jim. They make movies that are that are that fine. Even Twelve Angry Men. Twelve men sitting around at a bare tabletop on wooden chairs talking. Well, that's what the movie is about, really. It's what life is about to a large extent. People talking to each other one-on-one. -on -one. I don't suppose anybody's ever done a study, but I keep wondering what percentage of footage in the mass movies of the world consists of two people talking to each other. Nowadays, one of them's got to be talking to a, either a computer screen or a robot, or they will figure it's not filmable. I don't know. The story I really wanted to tell was about one of his legendary Halloween parties. This probably took place in the mid-1980s, when the parties were still in full throttle, and uh, lots and lots of people would show up. If you knew about the party, you were invited, and he would buy four or five kegs of beer, and music would be playing, and the crowds would be so full, his entire house was wall-to-wall -wall people, spill out into the front yard, into the street, and across the street into the park, across from his house. Anyway, he, this one uh, party, he decided to give a prize for the skimpiest Halloween costume, and I was sitting with him and a bunch of other people way back in the interior of his house, and we sort of heard what I could only describe as a bubble of silence wafting its way through his house. Uh, what it was, was a woman was coming up wanting to win the skimpiest costume, and wherever she was walking through the house, people stopped making noise to look at her because she basically had no clothes on at all. And she came in, and Jim looked at her and said yes, and she said, well, I'm here to win the skimpiest costume prize. And, I, and, he, and Jim said, well, you have to have a costume in order to win skimpiest costume. I thought she was going to say something like, well, I'm here as Lady Godiva without the horse. But instead, she stretched out her leg and pointed down to her ankle, where she had a very thin gold chain as an anklet. And she said, that's my costume. And Jim said, good enough for me, and gave her the prize, which I think was a Leonard Kratzlow t-shirt. If only we had that prize now, right? Anyway, she then got her prize and turned around and walked out. And Jim shouted after her, what, you're not staying? And she looked over her shoulder and waved goodbye and left. And that was just one of the type of things that could happen when you were uh, in the satellite of Jim Erickson. In a sense, I started teaching film when it was still possible to teach film. I don't know how you teach it now. End of speech. Plus, see, I haven't got such a bad life. Uh, I don't make a lot of money, but I'm a single man. I don't need a lot of money. I don't have expensive habits. I don't like to travel. Find something you're satisfied in doing that you feel is sufficiently useful to satisfy you. If you are contented where you are and somebody else is not contented where he is, you have a right to figure, I made it. He didn't. Even if he's the president of International Oil and you are a uh, ditch digger. If you're happy, you've made it.